Good morning to all of you. I would like to welcome you all to another CPD session organized by GMOA Sri Knowledge Academy. Before we begin, let me remind some housekeeping rules. The, as usual, the webinar link will be available from 9 to 9.50 a.m. to join in. No late attendees will be entertained. Each attendee should have been attend all this attended till in, at the end of the session of the webinar to obtain the certificate for CPD points. And the CPD points are strictly adhered to the NCCPD guidelines. This is to improve and maintain the standards of the CPD programs. And we kindly request you to switch off your videos and microphones to avoid any interruptions during the session. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we will be answering them at the end of the session. Today, our session is on acid-based status and blood gas analysis in clinical practice. We have Dr. Hima Loshada, acting consultant physician with us to introduce our guest speaker. Over to you, Dr. Himal. Thank you, Malumi. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we chose a topic which is uh, again very relevant to you when you're in uh, acute care setting, ICU, emergency setting, as well as day-to-day -day routine world work. Uh, today our topic is uh, acid-base balance and ABG analysis in clinical practice. Let me introduce today's speaker, who is Dr. Navanidam Mutulingam. Consultant, critical care physician, currently working in teaching hospital, Vietnam. He's a product of teaching hospital, Vietnam. He's a, sorry, he's a product of uh, Vietnam Medical Faculty. And he worked as a ICU care setting, as a MO and a trainee for a long time. And he took his uh, post MD training in 2018 and uh, worked in uh, UK at North Middlesex University Hospital in London as a his foreign trainee. So he has a lot of experience in these topics and with his teaching uh, experience. So without further ado, let me invite Dr. Navaneta Mutulingam uh, for the session. Dr. Navaneta, session is over to you now. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, and thank you for me to uh, give my presentation to this, uh, uh, this very valuable CBD program conducted by GMO Siri. So thanks for your kind introduction. We will go to our today's session. Uh, we actually, uh, our main discussion today is acid-based status and blood gas analysis in clinical practice. So, uh, in clinical practice, uh, the acid-base balance and the, the blood gas analysis, it's really important and it's a growing interest and growing uh, bedside test uh, in intensive care and the world setup. So my aim of discussion today is uh, mainly focused on the clinical aspect and how we apply the uh, apply our knowledge, uh, whatever we uh, get from the physiology and all of, all of the research and audits and everything. What are the information we gathered? How we applied this blood gas analysis and the information in clinical practice? So the first slide is containing what the importance of that. So blood gas analysis is a point of care and bedside test. It's more and more, almost all the hospitals in Sri Lanka nowadays, it's uh, equipped with the uh, acid gas, uh, acid base balance and uh, blood gas analysis to get the immediate bedside information. So we can use both arterial and venous sampling according to the contest. There are some, some speculations is most of the time people think is that arterial gas analysis is far better than venous. I always try to take an arterial sample, but according to the contest, if we are dealing with the acid 
acid base balance mainly the better we can go with the venous sample specifically the type of the ketoacidosis situation you don't need to pick again and again the arterial sample so just venous blood gas is cover whatever we need clinically so basically it's a quick and relatively safe test but arterial sampling is carries always its own risk mainly that you can get some bleeding in case of uh, blood uh, anticoagulator patients or sometimes you may get a thrombus as well. So you need to follow the, whatever the basic precautions when you are picking that. So modern gas analysis is, is actually is full of information. Maybe it's overwhelming information. Uh, and sometimes we may need to loss within the information with modern gas analysis. But if we know the basics of what are the information we need for the clinical context, then it's a very, very good uh, point of care test for our management. So what about the availability currently? In Sri Lanka is basically we have almost more major hospital and uh, some peripheral hospitals have arterial blood gas analysis but the problem during the recent economic crisis we don't have much enough uh, supply of uh, consumables so it's now the getting to a if blood gas analysis is costly and it's not available as early as so these lectures in this juncture is very important how to use whatever the chance of doing an ABG, how to use it effectively. So that's why I choose this. So even one one sample or one or two sample we did, we, if you know how we analyze that, that really helpful. So yeah. So technically, is an, uh, just for a quick review, the technically the ABG is we need to know at least when, when the things are went wrong, we need to know uh, how it works. So it's basically the ABG machine have three, three measurement uh, electrodes, basically the pH, PCO2, and PO2 electrodes. So additionally, there are some co-oximetry, but most of, our, most of our ABGs are not having co-oximetry. And, but additionally, we have electrolytes and the hematocrites. Okay, so the clinical information from the blood gas, that's a really important topic. We need to cover this one. Basically, clinical information mainly it give, give an idea about adequacy of oxygenation and adequacy of ventilation and determine the acid base status. Mainly, we will focus on that today. And we can see, importantly, the electrolytes but most of the time uh, in our set of these electrolytes, uh, it's, we couldn't get a um, most accurate electrolyte readings in the machine because of some calibration issues. But that's still, we have 90%, we have got a good electrolyte numbers. Serum lactate is a very, very valuable information in the blood gas analysis. Hemoglobin and glucose. So, and the co-oximetry is not available in our part of the world at the moment. Uh, but it's really important and helpful in some of the conditions for methemoglobinemia. So clinical, why we are using blood gas? That's a really, really important worthwhile question. So mainly in case, first is, is establishing diagnosis. So ABD give an idea, oh, this patient having a COPD exacerbation with the type 2 respiratory failure. So it's establishing diagnosis and it will guide the treatment. When we start the treatment, oh, we put on NIV, and then what will happen is after two hours time, we will do the ABG again and see how it's respond. So it will guide the treatment. In case if the patient in ICU, then we can change the ventilator setting according to the number. And it's basically, it's, it's a trajectory based and it's a timeline based test. So it's eight o'clock you did and then around 12 o'clock you did and the change, so see the change and then we will plan the management. So it's really important. And importantly, why we are worrying about the acid base status in clinical picture is actually our body cells and system is in the in the surrounding of the cell milieu, it's very much important to maintain that within a fixed pH range. Otherwise, all the enzymes and medications will not function properly. So that's an important clinical use to maintain that acid base because of that. Then it's very important in critically ill patients, we need to maintain the acid base and electrolyte to get, them, uh, get a proper clinical 
status to improve his acute illness. So, uh, next slide is mainly focus on technical precautions before while doing blood gas tests. It's really it's quite important because sometimes we we'll get the result, uh, a bit report, and we're not able to interpret. And we think about the, it's not entirely with the clinical context of the patient. So at that time we we'll get doubt about that. What's happened? So if you if you follow these technical precautions. Uh, we don't need to much get worried about if the report is valid or not. So before we draw any sample of APG, we should know oh, what is the temperature and what is the... So the basic precautions while doing APG is usually it's, it's a technical stuff, but we, before taking a sample, we all usually pre-heparinize the syringes, basically 0.1 ml of 1 in 1,000 heparin. An important one is you need to flush out the uh, syringe completely and not, do not leave any, any, any drop of heparin inside. So it may dilute your report. Second one is always ensure not to contact with the air bubble. If there is an air bubble in the syringe, it's definitely change your report. Mainly it change the oxygen value and make it the CO2 value is low. So these are the small things, but it may really important at the in clinical context. Then we need to send, as everyone know that, we need to somehow seal the syringe and send as early as possible to the lab. That's important. And the very important thing is you need to enter the details of how much of oxygen patient on and what is the temperature. The FiO2 and temperature is really important. When we go to the slides, you can get on why it's really important. So when we go for the blood gas interpretations, mainly it's First, we focus on oxygenation and ventilatory status. Then the second arm is acid-based status. In between, the volume, osmolality, and electrolytes play a role. So mainly we are dealing with the oxygenation and acid base. So mainly I can, uh, uh, mainly I will uh, focus on that in these lectures. So components of ABG, what's blood gas source? Mainly it's when we come into the Later on, we can. I will put a slide with the anatomy of blood gas and tell some details why it's important. So, component of ABG just go through mainly the pH and oxygen, PCO2, bicarb, and the base axis. Does everyone know? So, it's this is important. In the earlier, also, I told how, how the venous sample is affected. Venous sample, the difference between the venous sample, the basic numbers. PH is usually 7.35 to 7.45 in our detail sample, and the venous sample is usually it's only 0.4 to 0.6 is the difference. So in case of mainly we focus on the acid acid base status, the venous mixed venous uh, sample is enough to make a clinical decision. Uh, but the oxygenation is usually the venous one. It's telling, it's all the oxygen extract by the tissue. And when we come back in the venous, we get a lower value. It's indirectly telling how the oxygenation of the tissue is happening. So saturation is usually 95 and 75. And other two numbers usually know. The PACO2 also indirectly telling. It's usually it's around 35 to 45 in arterial sample and mixed with as roughly 40 to 50. So bicarb is almost same. That's why in acid-based status, mainly you are concentrating on acid-based status, that venous is more or more in fact more enough to make a clinical decision. So this is the anatomy of blood gas. This is, a, is it our blood gas. So our blood gas, it's mainly having a, there are three columns. When I go through the anatomy in detail, I will tell you. So this is the column that give, giving calculated values. And this is the column is giving whatever the values measured by those three electrodes I told. In this one, the radiometer one is not here. This is one additionally having coeximetry value. Why it is important, if you have a coeximetry, the calculated saturation, saturation is directly measured. But in our ABG, if there is no co-oximetry, the saturation is displayed here, is a calculated one by using oxygen dissociation. 
So this is the point of this is the this is the reason I put this slide and coaximate to give an idea about carbon uh, hemoglobin levels as well. So this is this uh, this ABG with the coaximetry is the thing we plan to progress. Some private laboratories and some of the national hospital and uh, candy hospital have coaximetry based uh, as gas analysis. So this is the anatomy of the blood gas. So measured values are most important because they are measured by the electrodes. And then this is the temperature correction. Clinically, that is much not significant. But we studied, uh, when we are studying physiology, we deal with this, but most of the time, clinically is irrelevant to the context. Calculated data, most of the time we need to know whatever the numbers here listed here is a calculated one so whatever the details you enter it's really matter to get a proper calculation so the pio2 and the temperature we usually enter but temperature correction is less clinically significant if pio2 is matter so bicarb actual is the one we use in the, the back of the slide we will use most of the bicarb the so-called bicarb is bicarb actual bicarb standard is clinically irrelevant again base access also most of the time nowadays it's not clinically used as earlier because of the evidence suggests uh, that base access uh, rather than concentrating on the base access it's a calculated value have some errors uh, as it is uh, compared with the algorithm so other parameters you know the pf ratio is really really important if you can calculate by PAO to divide by whatever the FIO is there. If you enter correctly, then you can straight away see during the COVID pandemic, PF ratio is it's everyone using this word so wide. So the next slide is I move into next slide. Is it moving properly or yeah? So yes, next, yeah, next slide. Usually we more concentrate in earlier when we are studying as medical students standard bicarbonate and base access. But you just go through this slide, it's clinically less detailed, it's clinically relevant details. So this is really important parameter, even though it's a calculated parameters, oxygen parameters are it's really needed. So oxygen content of the blood, it's how, actually how it's, uh, these parameters are calculated is, we have a PAO2 value, and then we put this value into the oxygen dissociation curve. An algorithm make these numbers displayed here by comparing the algorithm. Uh, that's PAO into the put into the oxygen dissociation curve, and we got the values here. So basically, oxygen content is an important value. It's mainly for transport, oxygen transport calculations. But again. Here, the issue is we all are calculated values, and we should know what is the limitation. So we'll, we'll go later on uh, how we use those parameters. So, so basically, PaO2, pH, and the PCO2 all are, uh, in summary, these three are measured values and really, really valuable information. Plus, bicarb actual is a calculated one, and that is the cornerstone of acid-based management, and then the oxygen oxygenation parameters have limited availability, and we will discuss in following slides. So usually, whenever we are dealing with blood gas, we have a stepwise approach. First thing is always important, how is the patient going to Then why we are doing ABG, that's a question is really important before going in. So evaluate oxygenation may be a target, and then evaluate acid based status may be a target. Then we will find out other clues and combine with these blood gas and atom make a clinical decision. So, first thing is first, whenever the ABG given at you, first thing is you need to see the oxygenation first. Because why? Oxygenation, if there is hypoxia, it kills the patient faster than other, other issues. So, always, whenever you meet ABG or any gas, blood gas given to me. Just quickly go to see the oxygenation. So when we are DC evaluating the oxygenation, first of all, clinical status. Again, we need to see the history and examination finding, how much of is the patient on oxygen or not, 
what kind of oxygen delivery device is given is it fixed to variable and what is the pio2 is given at the moment if the patient on face mask or some variable device it's very difficult to tell what is the pio2 but if the patient on venturi or high flow nasal cannula or cpap you can you can measure the pio2 correctly and tell and then it's again the next question is patient breathing by himself or on ventilator what's the gas we have in swati so only five things a clinical history and examination with oxygen or not what's the fractional inspiratory oxygen is breathing or not and is it venous or arterial that's why so the next slide we just go to the evaluation of oxygenation so before seeing into the abg uh, see the pao to value it's usually is 80 to 100 so when supplemental oxygen given, we should into the what, what how much of oxygen we are given. But there is an equation before seeing the PaO2 for normal people. We have expected the PaO2, expected PaO2 values, fraction of inspiratory oxygen into 500. Fractional inspiratory oxygen is put as 0.21, it's a 21 percentage. If it is 40 percent, it's 0.4. Then we can see how much we can expect in here. So then, when the APG given to you, you can compare. That's the first thing. So the next one is a PF ratio. It's always, always, when you are doing a blood gas analysis, please calculate the PF ratio. Rather than a single point PAO2, PF ratio giving an idea about how is the patient. So if the PF ratio is less than 300, there is an oxygenation failure. So that's more objective than using PAO to allow. Saturation again, that's, you know the number, 95 to 100. AA gradient is an alveolar arterial oxygen gradient. It has some value to find out what kind of oxygenation failure we have. So I'm skipping a little faster. If you're not able to follow when the discussion further going on, you can, I can summarize later. So alveolar arterial difference using this one, specific countries and we use so basically we need to if we have a dilemma of what kind of problem patient have this will help so to calculate the alveolar oxygen this equation will give an idea about that i'm not concentrating much on this this slide itself give a clue on that so this is usually to interpret the sun fraction so basically if there is an alveolar gas is higher and the oxygen gas is less, mean there is somehow it's not dissociated properly. There is some kind of shunt. Oxygen is going somewhere else. So if more than 30% shunt in alveolar oxygen different, that is critical shunt. That's it. If you know this point, that's enough. That's fine. So now. Arterial oxygen content, that is CaO2. So why we are worrying about this uh, arterial oxygen content? Basically, it is a constant number and the hemoglobin percent and the saturation of oxygen. So mainly hemoglobin is about 98 percent is carrying the oxygen and only two percent is dissolved. So uh, whatever the PaO2 we seeing in the ABG is dealing only the 2% two, two dissolved oxygen. Rest of the things is carried by hemoglobin. So arterial oxygen content, it's mainly dependent on the saturation of hemoglobin. That's the, that's the cornerstone of this slide. So I just put two patient uh, conditions, and when we're calculating the arterial oxygen content, even the patients carrying PaO to 85, and saturation of 95, but hemoglobin is 7, the content is 8.9, but the hemoglobin is 15, even saturation is 85, and very low P PaO2, the oxygen content in the blood is 17.1. So hemoglobin is very important when we are considering the arterial oxygen content. So these slides are mainly focused on that. So Oxygen is an assessment. Mainly, we have seen three important thing, important clues to give an idea of oxygenation assessment. 
First one is an oxygen content of the plant. It's mainly depend on the hemoglobin and the saturation of oxygen and very, very little influence of dissolved oxygen. Saturated oxygen is dissolved into the tissue and going into the cup plant. So then central venous oxygen we use for the, to see the tissue level consumption of oxygen. But the usage of these outside the ICU is limited. Lactate is really, really, you should know that lactate how is important. Because lactate is a single point surrogate to see how the tissues are delivered with oxygen. If the tissues are getting more and more, less and less oxygen, tissue level hypoxia, the tissues shift into anaerobic metabolism and they produce large amount of lactate. So tissue level uh, perfusion is de uh, detected by lactate. In case of septic shock, before seeing any gas numbers, quickly go and see the lactate is given idea of tissue level oxygen. So now we move into ventilation. Ventilation in blood gas analysis, PaO2 telling about how the patient is oxygenated and the PCO2 tell how the patient is ventilated. So this really given a nice idea about that. So we can see the PSU value of more than 45, 35 to 45 is eucapnia, less than 35 is hypocapnia. So as you all know, if it is more hypercapnia, it's hypoventilation. Eucapnia is they are ventilating normally and hyperventilation causing less, less CO2. So the matter of, I just give some information here in case of some opio opioid overdose, all patients come with opioid overdose, they have true hyperventilation. So they have more CO2. So true hypoventilation, usually hypercapnia. So in case of, this is really important rather than hypercapnia. Whenever you have seen the patient in a ward setup, if the patient with fever or pain or sepsis, they are very low CO. Even though these patients are really dangerous, they are about to go to uh, about to go to CO2 narcosis and low GCS and respiratory failure, type 2 failure, equally and more important, if the patient with very low CO2 also, they are in a risk of tired and going back to hypo uh, hypoventilation. So in PSH, ESCO2 assessment, you always think that sometimes we don't give much attention to low PSCO2 patients, but they also really, really important in case of assessment. So causes of respiratory failure just for the sake of you. It's if you no need to remember that this one, just correlate respirate, respiration, it's as started from the brain and end up in alveoli. With a problem in brain by some head injury or drug overdose, there's a chance to get respiratory failure, nerve injuries, bellows, mainly the thoracic palm and the muscle. And then they always, if, if they got obstructed, then there is a respiratory failure and then alveolar. So most of the time, the brain, nerves, and bellows failure and COPD or ARA failure, of course, type 2 respiratory failure and the alveolar level failure, it's called type 1 respiratory failure. So it's one disrupted link is enough to cause respiratory failure. It's just for the big thing. So some case scenarios. So 28-year-old female come with OP poisoning. is actually is respiratory rate on arrival 35, lot of secretions, heart rate is quite high, saturating 84, and the PAO2 of this patient is 52, and PCO2 is 32. Are we intubating this guy? Yes. Because this patient is on type one, respiratory failure, it's a mixed respiratory failure, that's fine. PCO2 is 32, so it's a type one respiratory failure, the patient hypercapnic, and other reason mainly is pooling of secretion, so it's a high risk of aspiration, so we are intubated. So when considering the ventilated, ventilated part by using the blood gas, rather than following the number, the contest is important.
that's why the first case you have your second one is so again the case of uh, PAC of is 56 with the PA of 58 and the respiratory rate is 35 so this patient is again having a mixed respiratory failure or type 2 respiratory failure with the decreased alveolar ventilation because of his pneumonia so this guy you can try it for some time uh, with the NIV and then go for ventilation. So now we move into the, the major component of this lecture is an acid base status analysis. So oxygenation and the CO2 is in the whole setup. It's usually we uh, mainly we do the blood gas to see the oxygenation and CO2. Oxygenation, when we are seeing the oxygenation, the contest is important rather than the number, and the content of arterial oxygen is really important. So you need to just have an idea about this 1.3 point hemoglobin into that uh, PA the saturation. So now we move the major part of this lecture. It's uh, that's the thing actually uh, wanted to concentrate acid base status of the body. Just sorry, but because of this crawling, yeah. So, so why the acid base status of the body is important because all the cells are inside, inside and outside within the water. Basically, our system floating into the water. So, the surrounding of the system and the status of the acid base status of the cellular system is important for the cellular level function. So acidosis and alkalosis, whatever the disorders causing alteration in the pH, it's caused acidosis. And what is acidemia? It's acidemia means if the pH is below one, 7.35 is acidemia, and if it is more than 7.45 is alkalemia. Acidosis means whatever the disorders causing that particular acidemia and al alkalemia, we will tell acidosis and alkalosis. So that's a different. Only different is that number in the blood that is emia. That's all. So, what is the basic concept? Basically, what why we are doing pH in acid base balance? pH is the matter. Why? Why not is H plus ion? H plus ion is the one is an acid. So, hydrogen ion concentration in aqueous solution is traditionally expressed by the pH. Why we are putting pH? Because is a H plus is a very small ion. It's a trace element. It's that's why it's coming in nano equivalent per liter. It's thousand times slower than smaller than the milli equivalent. So it's a very small element. So uh, dealing with this number and it's so volatile, so quickly change and there is a body buffers quickly remove this H plus. And the number is very quickly changed, so you can't measure it in real time. That's why they develop this logarithm approach of H plus. So that's the reason uh, we get the black pH rather than H plus I. Then when they are de uh, developing this as the pH concept, we don't have a facility to measure the H plus I. Now we can measure in modern laboratory, but still we are using this pH system because rather than the H plus ion alone, it's as I said mentioned earlier, it's not not available as an H plus ion for a longer time while doing the test. So this is really a speedometer like arrangement, telling because the body is maintaining a very narrow physiological window for acid base, 7.35 to 7.45. If less than 7.35 is an acidotic, if more than 7.45 is alkalotic. If the patient's pH reaches 6.8, it's not, not, a, not a number to survive. This is really a given idea about why, we, why this is really important. So the body's challenge is, when the body producing more volatile acids and the fixed acid, the body tend to go into acidosis status. And then the buffers 
try to pull back into keeping to neutral. So this is the thing happening in the body. So types of acids, we should know this. And then if you know this, uh, Henderson has a carbonic and carbonic and hydrate system, that's enough to deal the acid base status. So types of acids, mainly the volatile acids, is the one, CO2 is the major volatile acid. So what will happen? CO2 is highly water soluble. It's just dissolved in the water and become H2CO3. And it's transported into the lung and removed by the lung. Non-volatile acids, mainly the keto acids and lactic acids. So this is the one, is the cornerstone of these acid base status of the body. When the CO2 is there, it's fine with water and become H2CO3, so weak acids, it quickly dissolve H plus and bicarb. It's quickly uh, separated as hydrogen and bicarb. And then this is the function. So when K, in case of more acid in the body, what will happen is it's joined with the body bicarbonate buffer and make an H2CO3. And it's quickly transported into the lung and eliminated as the water, eliminated as the CO2. CO2 is eliminated. That's why CO2 is the fastest way of clearing this. So we are in the in the daytime by lungs, roughly 15,000 millimole per day of CO2 is eliminated. Why I'm telling this? Why it's really important to dealing this uh, CO2 elimination? So Fixed acids, mainly organic and inorganic acids, lactic, ketones, and some phosphoric and sulfuric acids. So removal of fixed acid is dependent on the kidney. So it's mainly it's done by eliminating the H plus and reabsorb the bicarb. is the main uh, way of kidney dealing the buffer system and also kidney removing these uh, organic acids. So. So what are the defense we have when hydrogen ion is going on? There's a three kinds of defense we have, mainly the chemical acid-based buffer system. It's either bound with the cellular, cellular surfaces or inside the plasma. Respiratory system, I, I told already, this is the fastest and quickest way to remove the acid. And then kidney takes some time, but it's steady and removing the Powerful acid base regulatory is kidneys. Powerful one is kidney, fastest one is chemical buffers in between the respiratory system. So, this is a very good idea, give a very good idea about how our body acts on the pH shift. So, first line is chemical. It's immediately bicarbonate buffer system bind the H plus, make it H2CO and eliminate. So, protein and phosphate buffer system, they start very quickly very fast, 80% they mainly in this year. So then respiratory mechanism usually start within two hours by eliminating the CO2 and complete the compensation 12, within 12 to 24 hours. Second line, physiological power, renal mechanism usually start after a few hours, but take up to five to seven days to complete. Why I'm concentrating on this to come back this. So, me just follow what we are dealing here. So acid-base balance, whatever we are talking in acid-base balance is based on the henderson hasselbach equation. This is the henderson hasselbach equation. pH is equal to pKa is a constant. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not trying to tell what is the number here because it's not relevant to the clinical factors. Plus logarithm of bicarb concentration divided by pHCO. So when we look at this state for the clinical contest or teaching purpose, we make it pH is approximately equal to bicarb divided by PSCO. So arterial CO2. So bicarb is just I put kidney because it's bicarb built by the kidney and PSCO built by the lung. So when we come back to the pH, if the patient pH is 7.35 and it's going down, that's mean it's acidic, then as I said, it's indirectly, it's telling the primary problem is acid is producing by the body 
and it's binding, taking out the bicarb. So bicarb is going down. So it's simple. By the physics, is the uh, upper component is going down. To maintain this constant of P, definitely the lower component has to go down. It's very simple. So this component has to go down. That's fine. So that whenever we are seeing an acidosis, uh, in the body, the bicarb is going down. Immediately, the mechanism of compensation is the CO2 will go down. So why? It's very simple. It's just if the pH is go up, that means it's uh, alkalosis. So it's some kind of bicarb produced by the body. It's more bicarb produced. So this bicarb is going up. So as like a physics, this number is going up. And because of this, the compensation to maintain this back to normal, that means this has to go up. But why this is not so simple in clinical practice? As I mentioned earlier, it's not handled alone by CO2 or by car. There are some fixed assets. So that's why we need to do those uh, calculations and all because of that. So, Concept we need to remember. I just summarized the concept below down slides. So extracellular fluid hydrogen ion is maintained, this balance maintained by the partial process of carbon dioxide and concentration of bicarb in the fluid. So this is the equation is telling. So whatever it is we are dealing, the difference between the PCO2, the ratio between the PCO2 and bicarb. Always give an idea of secondary responses. So, first concept so whenever there is an increase in pH, PCO2 by some means, as I said, now the CO2 is going up by some means. The aim is what? According to the equation, pH has to be constant. So, automatically, the lower down part is going up. So, the upper down part has to go up and come up. This is how the balance is operate. So when we go to the stepwise approach, we can find out further in detail. So before this, why we are doing stepwise approach in ABG? That's a question. It's answered easily. When we are reading the ECG, we will follow PQRS to find out, make an exact diagnosis without much issues. The same thing for the ABG also, stepwise approach, Avoid errors. So please follow the stepwise uh, approach to avoid errors. But following these seven steps to make a clinical diagnosis sometimes is practically impossible. So at the end of the lecture, I will tell what I am using. It's everyone is using it's quick screening, like whenever you are taking an ECG, you are quickly screening or like that, quick screening of ABG report by using that chapter and then follow the stepwise approach is far practical than going these seven steps. So step one, always whatever the data given to you, we need to check if the data is consistent. There's a way to check your ABG measure is working fine. So H plus concentration in extracellular fluid normally varies less than 10 nano equivalent per liter. So, we do two different calculations and compare. If it's maintained within 10, that's mean you are ABG machine delivering the correct report. So this equation, I, I put 24, and what is the PACO value displayed there, I put there, and then I put the bicarb value and get that number, it will give some H plus, and then I put H plus 7.8 and minus what the pH is displayed in my ABG, into 100, that will give another number. If these two numbers, A and B, within 10 difference, that means your gas is fine. Okay. Uh, so, so whenever the gas is given to you, you can, when we are dealing with some lesser, usually we put like that pH, PSO2, PAO2, and bicarb in order. So some, some equations I put here. So first patient is, so the third one is 
53.1 PCO2 and 63.2 PaO2 and bicarb is 44. This equation giving an idea about 28 is the calculated H plus in the first way, A and second way telling 26. So this data, data is consistent because it's within 10. So uh, the first one is telling the data is inconsistent. So first step is always using this equation. A is 24 into PaCO2 divided by bicarb is an A way of finding out the H plus. And the second one is this, using this equation. Sometimes if you are doubt about this, your pH is not relevant to the context, use this step one. So most of the time we will skip the step one because they, our machines are most of the time calibrated properly. Step two is it's the cornerstone. Check it with less than 7.35 acetemia and more than 7.45 as the alkali. That's fine. This is I just skip because this is one you know very well. Yes. So then the first aim. We find out is it acidosis or alkalosis. Second, first we check the data is correct. Second one is is it acidosis or alkalosis? That is already correct. Step three, I told you what is the primary problem. So, primary problem either it could be a CO2 is high or it may be an H plus is indirect. High is indirectly reflected in the bicarb. So, change in either PCO2 or bicarb will cause the change in the extracellular fluid. So, when the PCO2 is the major change for the H plus level, then it is called respiratory acid test. So, when the bicarb is responsible for change in the H plus, that is H plus. So, in case if H plus is going up or going down, because of we directly see seen by bicarb, it's metabolic, etc. So, when there is a CO2 is increased, the context of acidosis is respiratory acidosis. When the CO2 is decreased in the concept of acidosis, respiratory alkalosis. When the bicarb is down, that is metabolic acidosis because it's indirectly telling H plus, all the H plus are taking out the bicarb. So bicarb is down, that is metabolic acidosis. By metabolic reason, more H plus is taking out all the bicarb. That is metabolic acidosis, so decrease in bicarb is acidosis, increase in bicarb is alkalosis. So, this is the summary of the primary disorder. So, the primary disorder in case of metabolic acidosis, pH is low, that means acidosis, and the primary, because of the low bicarb, the patient having metabolic acidosis, and as I said earlier, secondary compensatory mechanism always should follow the same direction by car. So it's secondary responses or compensatory responses always same direction because this this is the one it's a physics when we're studying the physics the first component of the this one if something goes down here it should be go down here to maintain this one so that's the thing you always remember if you know that that's fine so again, pH is goes up alkalosis because of more production of bicarb. So the primary problem is metabolic alkalosis because of the first component is going up, well, the CO2 has to go up because to maintain the balance. The same here, in case of respiratory acidosis, first pH is low, that's mean acidosis because of CO2 is going up, so it's a volatile acid. CO2 is produced more and more because of the respiratory system daily. So it's respiratory acidosis. The secondary response is by the second number in the equation has to go up. So we go to the third step. Third step is find out the primary response. So when we dealing with see how what is the primary risk, the primary problem, you can use this mnemonic, respiratory ease of acids. That's really helpful of uh, 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 really helpful uh, mnemonic. So assess the PCO2 less than 7.3, that's mean acidosis. 
and the PaCO2 goes up, then that means uh, if the pH and PCO2 moves in opposite direction, the problem is respiratory problem. So this is really a very good, uh, a very good idea to find out this one. This is called a Rome uh, way of find out the problem. So what are the reasons for respiratory acidosis? We already told. I already told respiratory failure causing type two respiratory failure. Cause respiratory acidosis. So, what are the causes for respiratory alkalosis? If there is any stimulation into the central nervous system, or uh, and respiratory stimulus by anxiety, and if you put on mechanical ventilator and give more and more tidal volume, and sepsis causing acidosis and make a stimulus and make it respiratory center go beyond higher level, it can cause. Wash out the CO2 and make alkalosis. So metabolic, again, this this figure is telling nicely. Metabolic problem is mainly detected by the bicarb. So if the bicarb, whatever the direction is move, pH also move in that direction. It will give the primary problem of metabolic process. So in metabolic acidosis, pH is low. And bicarb is low because both are moving in the same direction. That's a primary problem. In metabolic alkalosis, pH is high because of bicarb is high. So metabolic is equal, respiratory is opposite. This is the cornerstone to find out the primary. So, what is the secondary response? So, I'm not much uh, concentrating on these poses because we will leave later that one. So, it's very, very simple way to remember these numbers. Uh, we'll come back later uh, to find out these causes. So, what is metabolic calculus? Now, step four is find out the secondary response. So, if the primary disturbance is respiratory, determine. Back before going to this step. So first step we finished. Second step is we find out is it acidosis or alkalosis. Third step is what is the primary problem. That's always it's but we can use the room if respiratory problem it's opposite to the pH. The metabolic problem is parallel with the pH. Then the second one, the fourth step, if there is a respiratory problem. We need to identify this acute problem, chronic problem. Then, well, how the compensation is going on, and the other two are is little advanced, but it's somehow we need to know and we need to use in the practice. So, now we come back to the step four. This is the one is a herbosome and problematic when we are dealing with the acid phase, and we need to remember some equations to deal with this. I just simplified it for some reason to use in clinical practice. So if the primary problem is a respiratory, that means the, the respiratory system is working low or working high. That's why CO2 is retaining or eliminating. How, how many hours it's happening? How many days is there? We can find out by blood gas by using some calculations. So for that, usually in case of respiratory acid, in case of respiratory acidosis, is it acute? We have an equation for it. every 10 increase in PCO2 is reflected by one increase in bicarb, okay, and decrease in pH by 0.08. In chronic, but every 10 increase in PCO2 is reflected as three milli equivalent bicarb rise, and the pH it's make it. 0.03. The same and alkalosis. If 10 decrease in PCO2 is causing by, bicarb will decrease by two numbers and it's 0.08 again. 
Tony, it's four numbers. Now, to sum up, this is the thing. Respiratory acidosis, the bypass goes off by one in acute and three in product. Respiratory alkalosis, bicarb goes down two in acute, four in product. So one, two, three, four, arrange as respiratory acidosis, acute chronic, respiratory alkalosis, acute chronic. Now, respiratory acidosis, acute one, chronic respiratory alkalosis, acute. So first is acute respiratory acidosis one, respiratory alkalosis is two, then uh, three for chronic, uh, four for chronic alkalosis. So one, two, three, four. So I make it for the respiratory compensation calculator. Everything in the unit of 10 millimeter mercury CO2, you just remember four numbers. Start with acute respiratory acidosis. One, two, one, two, three, four. You can arrange like, as I said earlier, one is respiratory acidosis acute, two is respiratory alkalosis acute, three is respiratory acidosis chronic, Four is respiratory alkalosis. One, one, two, three, four. That's that's how we. You can remember like this also. Acute finis and then tonic. That's also. But just remember one, two, three, four. And the previous slide is easily tell what is one and what is two. So. Step five. So, what how about compensation for the metabolic part? So, metabolic compensation, we always follow Winter's formula, but it's very difficult in clinical countries to do this calculation. For the Winter's formula, you can easily remember you are in case of metabolic acidosis, your PCO2 at least should be like last two digits of the field. If the pH is 7.35, the pH is 7.15, that's mean your compensated uh, uh, respiratory compensation PCO2 at least should be 50, like that. Metabolic calculus also the same. There's an easy way to remember this equation. So now these three slides, I will tell why we are doing these compensations. So compensatory responses is really important. These are secondary responses to maintain the pH in the normal mass within the normal range. So as I said, it's a it's a mass. The pH is equal to bicarb and uh, CO2. So in one component, this goes up. Other component should go up to maintain the balance. So compensatory mechanism always synchronized. Okay. So among itself, if PaCO2 and bicarb, it's, if the primary problem is increasing PaCO2, secondary response will involve increasing bicarb to maintain the H plus. That's it. Go other side. So if the primary metabolic disorder is either acidosis or alkalosis, again, use the measured bicarb to identify the expected PaCO2. That's what we did. If the measured and expected PSO2 are equal at the condition is fully compensated. This is important. That's the thing we did earlier. In case, if we are, see the measured PCO2 and the expected PCO2, if both are numbers correct, that's been fully compensated. But in clinical contests, you should remember any contest is never get fully compensated. But we, have, we are doing some practice later. And that's telling it's fully compensated, but in clinical cancer, when you are seeing the ABG, it's never ever overcompensated. It can come to 3.4, but never come to 3.48 in case of correction. Like that. If the measured PSEO2 higher than the expected PSEO2, it's superimposed respiratory acidosis. So, in case we are just saying we are measuring a CO2. And for the metabolic acidosis, 
we think the CO2 should have to come at least seven, the pH is 7.15, and we are calculating uh, the CO2 is coming as 22, that's mean it's both together. Again, sir. Okay. So we come back to here. So this is this slides, we give an idea. In case of metabolic acidosis, definitely the CO2 goes down. It can go up to 10. In metabolic alkalosis, this PaCO2 goes up to manage. It can go up to 60. In respiratory acidosis, bicarb is going up. It can going up up to 40 and more than that, some extent. But up to 40, you need to think. And alkalosis has come down, bicarb has come down up to 10. Why these numbers is there? This is for the shortcut. When you see in ABG, patient with uh, metabolic acidosis, pH is 7.2 with the PCO2 of uh, 10 and bicarb is 10. And you're just calculating the last digit of pH is 10 and the PCO2 is 10. Okay, it's the compensated metabolic acidosis. So these numbers, these rough numbers, is avoid these calculations. You can see up to these numbers in clinical picture. So, why the mixed disorders? How is happening? When you are suspect mixed disorder, it's very simple. As I said, if definitely there is a metabolic or respiratory problem by seeing the CO2 and bicarb, but the pH is normal, definitely you need to think there is a mixed disorder. If either pH or PCO2 is normal in acid base analysis, it's indirectly telling is a mixed metabolic and respiratory acid base disorder. One is make it pH normal, one could be an alkalosis, make the pH is normal. So the direction of change of PACO2 is identify respiratory disorder and if the PCO2 name is normal, if the direction of change in pH identify the metabolic disorder. So if we, are, if we get an ABG with a pH of 7.4, okay, and PCO2 of 65, and the bicarb of uh, 32, uh, bicarb of uh, 10, we, we uh, have some doubt. What is the major problem? then pH is normal. So at that point, we always give, see the PACO2 and see how it's going. And that will give an idea about respiratory disorder is there. So this is about mixed disorder. And step six. For the mixed disorder, these two slides tell about how it is going on. For the respiratory acidosis, if the measured pH is lower than the expected, respiratory acidosis, measured pH is lower than the expected pH for the acute uncompensated condition, they are in the superimposed metabolic acidosis. So, what is the meaning of this? Is we are just we are getting a respiratory acidosis patient. And I measure by using that one, two, three, four equation. And we found it's an acute condition, uncompensated. It's superimposed metabolic acidosis. Like that, it's telling these mixed disorders. So I will summarize in easy way later. So if there is a metabolic acidosis, then we will do the anion gap. So anion gap is actually, what is anion gap? Anion gap is telling fixed acids, dealing the acid base balance. When the first slide I told lactate and the ketones are fixed acids, they are hidden inside the um, anion gap. So indirectly we have found out the hidden acid inside by using this anion gap. So basically anion gap is sodium minus chloride the bicarb. Normal anion gap is 12 milliequivalent per liter. So why we are doing anion gap? Because we are not able to measure some anions by our blood gas. 
these are proteins, organic acid, phosphate, sulfur. So they are roughly 23, and unenmesed cations are 11, so the difference is 12. So this indirectly telling, this onion gap is indirectly telling, there are some unmesed ions and unmesed cations. So whenever we are dealing with onion gap, you don't forget albumin. Because albumin is a negative charge, is an albumin is a cation, is a is a cation. So it's if there is a low albumin, it's indirectly other, your anion gap is low. So always correct the anion gap by using albumin. This is the equation. Observed anion gap plus 0.25 into this is the 4.5 gram per each albumin minus patient albumin. So you can correct and adjusted anion gap is always used in case of low albumin. So other causes of low albumin, mainly low anion gap. This is about albumin. Some other unmeasured cations also play a role in low anion gap situation. That is mainly you need to know this paraprotein in gap, multiple myeloma, lithium toxicity high calcium, so low calcium, often low calcium, you can get low and gap. Okay. So, now we move into, in case metabolic acidosis, are we doing an end gap? You can calculate an end gap, but because of one measure and that. Okay, now just remember causes of anion gap acidosis or high anion gap acidosis, mainly the alcohols, methanol, ethanol, ethylene glycol, and lactic acid, DK, and urea. So, mainly these mud piles is very good mnemonic. It's tell what are the causes of high anion gap acidosis. Clinically, it's mainly the lactic acidosis. DK, uremia, and some poisoning by methanol, ethylene glycol, and sulfur. So mainly, these are non-volatile acids. They are indirectly high inside the amine gap. So step seven is to find out other metabolic disturbance come with the acidosis. In the presence of high anion gap metabolic acidosis, it is possible the patient may have another metabolic acidosis disorder. So, normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, so metabolic alkalosis, can be hidden inside the high anion gap metabolic acidosis. It's in the contest, I just tell you, in case if you are giving a bicarb for a DKA patient, if now they have a high and then get metabolic acidosis because as you are giving a bike of infusion, they have metabolic alcohol inside. So how you can find out? If the patient on prusimide infusion, it's cause of alkalosis. So for that, we will use this delta gap. So delta gap, I just, just tell the, uh, just try to concentrate in this equation. Delta anion gap minus delta pi gap is a delta gap. So patient gap minus 12. Patient gap is anion gap minus 12 into uh, reducted from 24 minus patient anion gap. If that one is more than six, coexisting disorder is metabolic alkalosis. If less than six, that is non-anion gap metabolic acid. So this is about delta gap. Delta gap, how we are doing is, it's for to find out what are the thing is mixed with that, uh, our higher level metabolic acid. If it is more than six, that metabolic alkalosis is mixed with the higher level gap. It's usually happen in prusimide treatment and bicarb treatment. If less than six means non-nanian gap metabolic acid is there. So delta gap is to find out what is gap gap? It's, it's an advanced one. Usually it's the difference. And then gap excess divided by, by gap excess. I'm not concerned on that. Uh, 
and we move amount of these slides is for the completion. So what are the causes of non neonic gap metabolic acidosis? Mainly is an area of hyperalimentation and acetylamide treatment. Renal tubular acidosis is a major cause of non neonic gap acidosis. Diarrhea and renal tubular acidosis is a major cause of non neonic gap acidosis. Hard up is an easy uh, way of mnemonic to remember this. How we go to the practice. A little fast down, but in the practice, you can identify how we progress. So, this is how I did this. Uh, we all did simplified analysis, give an idea about this. Now we come back. We have a patient with a pH of 7.3, 7.2, with a bicarb of 12. PCO2 of uh, 25, it's simple, it's pH and bicarb in same direction. As I said, compensation always same direction of bicarb. So all three are same direction, that is metabolic acidosis. When you are seeing a patient with a pH of 7.5, bicarb of 42, and PCO, PCO2 of 55. So pH and bicarb, those are the metabolic components. Both are equal. Compensation is always parallel to the bicarb. So CO2 is high. So it's metabolic alkalosis. So metabolic alkalosis, just you need to remember the pH and bicarb in the same direction. Compensation is always same direction. So it's metabolic alkalosis. Third one, in respiration, it's I told, pH in one direction, and CO2 is the respiratory component in acid base balance, so respiratory opposite. As I said, compensatory mechanism always follow the CO2, so bicarb will go up. Now, respiratory acidosis, how you find out the respiratory acidosis? It's very simple. Respiratory component of the acid base balance, CO2, and the pH in opposite direction. Bicarb is always follow the CO2 because secondary response is parallel to the parallel among them. So it's, this is the one. Respiratory alkalosis, again, same. Respiratory opposite. This arrow is wrong, actually. So it's, you can easily uh, use what I tell. Respiratory opposite. So, in case of pH is high, PCO2 is low because respiratory is opposite, and bicarb is always below the CO2. Yeah. Now, these, uh, these things will easily give an idea about how to deal next. Now, the patient comes with pH of 7.35 and is an acid process, definitely. Bicarb is 10. So we know by if the bicarb is low and acidosis, that's metabolic, that's fine. But whenever the secondary response has to follow the bi, follow whatever the problem happens. So it should have go to PCO2, it should go down, but here is high. That's mean it's go against the compensatory mechanism. That's mean it's combined two problems. So it is raw respiratory opposite and metabolic equivalent. Just follow this. pH is low, metabolic. Bicarb is low here, metabolic equal. And pH is low, PCO2 high, is respiratory opposite. So it's a combination of metabolic and respiratory acidosis. So in case, if there is a combination of Rome, that is mixed metabolic and respiratory combination. Now, again, for the alkalosis, it's again said pH is high. So, definitely, in case metabolic, we think bicarb has to high. But then now we see the PSEO2. Oh, that's low. It should have high because it follows the compensation. But here, low, that's mean it's 
mixed respiratory component as well. So it's metabolic equal again, pH and bicarb go in the same direction, so metabolic equal, pH and CO2 is goes opposite, so it's respiratory opposite, so it's a combination of respiratory and metabolic alcohol. When you take an ABG, put the arrows and put this, you can quickly come to the diagram. Now, these two are the matters. You see this, you get the pH of 7.4 on a patient, that's normal pH. Bicarb is low, as I said, in when you are analyzing the primary, if the bicarb is low, that's mean metabolic. How it get pH get normalized? It has to be normalized by production of CO2. Okay, but it's usually how we know this one. Okay, we just go through the how to find out the compensation is adequate or not. That's fine. Okay, compensation is adequate, but it's never overshoot. If you get a pH of 7.43 with the metabolic acidosis and the PCO to low, it's usually not happening. This is the point you should remember. In case of you are getting a pH normal in near to the alkalotic side, it's never happened by compensation. If you remember this, you can find out the mixed metabolic acidosis and alkalosis easily. The same again mixed acidosis and alkalosis. Mixed acidosis and alkalosis, you can find out easily. pH is normal, bicarb is low. Bicarb is low is mean, is an acidosis, it's a metabolic acidosis. And PaCO2 is high, that's mean, CO2 is high, it's definitely is a respiratory acidosis. So both respiratory acidosis and metabolic acidosis are there, but pH is get normalized. How is it possible? There is an alkali inside. So you no need to go through all these equations to find out your case by these numbers and find out these one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four is important to find out acute or chronic. But you no need to calculate these uh, winters formula and all to find out what's the problem your patient has. If you know the arrows, it's fine. Metabolic acid is always pH follow bicarb is equal. As I said, compensatory mechanism always follow the bicarb direction. So every arrow are in same direction is metabolic acidosis. Every arrow are in opposite direction, that is metabolic alkalosis. pH is one direction, and the PCO in opposite direction, that means respiratory opposite, respiratory acidosis. As I said, bicarb always follow the direction of CO2 for the secondary compensation. So bicarb in opposite this direction, this is respiratory acidosis. Respiratory alkalosis again saying this, uh, these arrows are went wrong, but you know the contest, pH is goes up, that's mean respiratory, uh, PACO2 has go down, respiratory opposite. If the CO2 goes down, bicarb definitely go down for the compensation, so that's fine. If mixed, it's always combine of both, metabolic equal, and you can see respiratory opposite together in an ABG, that's mean mixed metabolic and respiratory acidosis, and the same thing for the mixed respiratory alkalosis also. If you see the both respiratory opposite and metabolic equal, that is mixed, the pH normalized, you think mixed plus, Alkalosis is there. So if you know this summary, you can identify any case by using this, putting the arrows. So these examples, uh, I think organizers, this share this presentation, PDF file uh, to the all the members joined today. And this is a very good reference. I actually I concentrate on make it as a reference slides. So now we go towards our questions. Uh, Lagma, can we go to the pre lecture MCQs and answer? Hello? Thank you very much for the presentation, sir. Uh, Dr. Lagma has to leave because he has got an urgent work to do. Uh, yeah. So there are, there are questions from the participants. 
the first question is what is meant by a smaller gap and what are the uses a smaller gap and the uses so uh, the first uh, the question is is here, is here in the slide as well please share the slide is really helpful to in every day to day time with us so this is i just because of the time reason and initial delay i skipped this slide so when the case of increased anion acidosis I, I, as I said, there are some hidden fixed acids. We don't know. In the, one patient comes with severe metabolic acidosis. He's an alcoholic. And we don't know what's inside. They are in, in patients come with uh, alcoholos, uh, alcoholic patients. That acidosis, it could be due to alcohol overdose, or it could be due to uh, alcoholic ketoacidosis, because alcohol can produce ketones. And because of uh, alcohol, it can develop some kind of lactic acidosis as well. So when we are suspecting a patient with high anion gap metabolic acidosis, immediately we have to find out those smaller gaps by using the equation of this. Osmolar gap is a measured osmolality minus calculated osmolality. Calculated osmolality to sodium, Two into sodium plus glucose in the milligram and blood urea uh, millimoles, glucose in millimoles and blood urea nitrogen in millimoles. Usual or smaller gap is less than 10. If you find more than 10, that means there are some osmotically active particles like ethanol, methylene glycol, and ethylene glycol. That's fine. Next question, please. Hello. Thank you, sir. Next question. Regarding low base excess and high base excess, what is the clinical importance? What? I couldn't catch your question. Your question. Uh, what is the clinical importance of low base excess and high base excess? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. The base excess is actually clinically less relevant nowadays because base excess indirectly tell us how much of base, you need to, how much of acid, base excess negative two, we are considering the base excess plus two to minus two is the normal base excess. That's mean you need to, in case of base excess minus two mean is acidosis basically in the clinical context. That's mean you need to add two into body weight of by car to correct back. It means if the base excess mean four means you need to add go into body weight of bicarb to correct back to your normal pH. Basics is indirectly telling unmeasured fixed assets. So because of it's a calculated value by using other numbers, and uh, that's called a Sagat graph, they found out using base excess as for the clinical uh, chemicals, it has more errors than using bicarb and anion gap. That's why they are nowadays, they are not using base and base gap, base access for the treatment. So it's clinically, it's nowadays, it's less relevant. Uh, we are not using that one. We are not correcting by any acidosis, alkalosis by using base access. Still, there are some there are practices going on, but going on, the recent evidence are that it's clinically it's, Irrelevant to the Next. Okay, so the next question is in emergency management, what is the place for bicarbonate correction in metabolic acidosis or respiratory acidosis? At which yes. pH value? It's a really, really important clinical question. So, giving bicarb only three evidence based indications. If there is a pH is less than 7.1 by any means, specifically in the metabolic acidosis, not the respiratory acidosis. If the pH is less than 7.5 in the context of metabolic acidosis, you can give bicarb to correct the acidosis because in case of CV acidosis, the body responds to the intrinsic inotropes and intrinsic inotropes is very low and patient become hypotensive. It's already a septic patient, 
and they are already on some kind of inotropes because of the severe acidic nature, enzymes are not working and patient is severely hypotensive. In this clinical cancer, we need to correct the bicarb as early as possible to make the patient hemodynamically stable. That's why we will give bicarb. So only indication for giving bicarb is pH is less than 7.5. This is further low if the acidosis is due to diabetic acidosis. You should not give bicarb even pH up to if less than 6.9 only, you should give bicarb in DKA patients. So, so only indication for giving bicarb is pH less than 7.1. That is a straightforward indication. That is even less than 6.9 in case of DKA. Second indication is the acidosis there, but hemodynamically compromised unless there is no other reason for hemodynamic compromise other than the acidosis. You suspecting like that, then you have to give the bicarb to raise the correct acidosis. Then it's automatically the hemodynamic compromise will improve. So second reason for bicarb giving bicarb is if pH is more than 7.1, but acidosis is there, you are strongly suspecting this is your hypotension or hemodynamic compromise because of acidosis. You can give bicarb. The third one is you know the cause of uh, acidosis is a bicarb loss in case of renal tubular acidosis, you should give bicarb. So these are the three indications. In respiratory acidosis, you can give bicarb, but you should know whatever the bicarb given, it's become CO2. And if your patient is already on type two respiratory failure, if you have some means to eliminate the CO2, by giving, if the patient is already on mechanical ventilation and airway air, 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 uh, resistant or bronchospasm is reasonably manageable by you, then you can give bicarb to make the hemodynamics under control. And you should be able to remove whatever the amount of bicarb converted into CO2 by some controllable measure by yourself. So, respiratory acidosis, when we are giving bicarb, you should have an idea. This, if the patient on uh, bronchial asthma exacerbation, life-threatening bronchial asthma exacerbation, not making any tidal volume at all, because of pH is 7, if you give a CO2, the patient will die because whatever the bicarb you give is converted inside CO2 and it's further worsening the CO2 natural. Always keep an idea. If you have a patient with the type 2 respiratory failure, it's making CO2 retain very badly, and you are not in a position to improve the ventilation, better not to give bicarb to correct the hemodynamics by giving bicarb. Try to remove the CO2 by some means. Fine, if it's okay. 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 Thank you very much, sir. Uh, yeah. With time limitations, we will now conclude our session. So uh, our sincere thanks goes to Dr. Navanidhan Mudalingam, Acting Consultant Critical Care Physician in Teaching Hospital Jaffna for his excellent lecture and precious time. And also I would like to thank Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine for this joint collaboration effort with GMOA. And thank you everyone who joined with us today. We will hope to see you again on next week with another CPD session. Thank you. Thank you very much.